We now have the third of uh, the, the academic speakers that we're going to hear from, uh, and another perspective on thinking about Black 47 and the family. And this is from Charles Reed, uh, currently at Cambridge University, but somebody who, as an economic historian, uh, in a relatively short career, I think I'm allowed to say, has had a, uh, a, an extraordinary record of, of achievement um, in Oxford as well as in, in Cambridge, and who's going to talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the financial crisis that afflicted the British Treasury at the time of 47-48. Uh, uh, so over to you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much, Simon and Victoria, for inviting me to speak um, today. And um, I've always wanted to visit Skibbereen because of its links to the Great Famine, of course. And um, it and it's, looks like we've got a fantastic weekend of weather as well to do it. And uh, um, so the Irish Famine, or Great Hunger, of the 1840s is the biggest economic and humanitarian disaster in the modern history of these islands. Starvation, disease, and emigration reduced Ireland's population by a quarter. Ooh. Sorry, that didn't. Could we go back to the first, the first slide? That was all. Thank you. Um, um, reduced Ireland's population by a quarter between 1845 and 1851. The size of the island's economy fell by a fifth, and the crisis had long-term effects too. Emigration remained high for more than a century after the famine, and the result is that the island of Ireland is the only country-sized area of Europe with a smaller population than it had in today than it did in 1845. Can we go on to the next slide? Thank you. As already mentioned... In this panel, Black 47 has come to symbolise the worst horrors of the famine. And I've just picked up a, picked a cartoon in my, from my forthcoming book, a woodcut from uh, publishing the Illustrated London News in February 1847 of a street scene in Skibbereen where death had become such an everyday event that there's a coffin passing down the street and the famished famished victims of the famine are uh, too weak to stand up to pay respects to the coffin down the street. So this even everyday scene shows the horror of what was going on at the time. Um, I'm keen to find out where, where, which street this, this picture might have been taken, uh, this, this picture might have been drawn on. If anyone has any ideas afterwards, do, do let me know. Um, but it's apparently somewhere in Skibbereen. Um, in this talk, I will reveal a new um, history of the role of policy and of the financial and fiscal crisis in Britain in the disaster, which was Black 47. But before we get on to 1840 itself, I will briefly explain uh, or give a recap of policy and its roots to getting to 1847 from the start of the famine in 1845. So two years before the year 1847, in the autumn of 1845, two potato diseases, phytophorin and festans and dry rot, struck Ireland for the first time, killing a third of Ireland's potato crop. But initially, the excess mortality rate was low. The limited nature of the failure in the first year and the deployment of relief policies by the government initially averted mass mortality. Sorry, next slide. Um, so in 1845, Sir Robert Peel's Conservative ad government adopted on a larger scale the same policies that previous administrations had implemented since the 1820s when famine threatened Ireland. The government imported alternative foodstuffs to ensure that there was enough food available to be bought in Ireland and provided employment on public works to ensure that unemployed agricultural labourers and cottiers had enough money to buy the food available for their families. In addition, in June 1846, Peel's government also repealed the Corn Laws, taxes on the imports of grain into the United Kingdom, a measure that he claimed was intended to help Ireland by lowering food prices. But his back conservative backbenchers, still attached to protectionism, were quick to take their revenge, and almost immediately his government collapsed and his party permanently split in two. 
So the descendants of Peel's front benches are institutionally now the Liberal Democrats. The back benches went off and formed a new party, also called the Conservative Party, which is the direct institutional ancestors of today's Conservative Party. Um, which is a bit bizarre that the Duke of Wellington, a lifelong conservatism, actually founded the modern Liberal Party rather than the modern Conservative Party, um, seeing that he, he, he went with Peel in that split. Peel's policy helped stave off the full effect of famine for a year, but in the autumn of 1846, up to 95% of the crop, potato crop, was lost. With the tubers that provided food and employment that supported 3 million out of Ireland's 8 million or so people, this was what caused the trigger, the mass destitution and suffering seen in the winter of 46 and the start of Black 47. But in some ways, later on in 1847, this should have been the start of the end of the famine on some metrics. In the summer of 1847, huge consignments of food imports began to arrive in Ireland, lowering food prices towards the end of the year. In the autumn harvest of 1847, potato yields began to improve for the first time since the blight arrived. But this was not the start of the end of the famine. The human suffering and excess mortality of Black 47 remained high throughout the year and beyond. If anything, it actually got worse in 1848 and 49. The renowned economist Cormac O'Brada has calculated that excess mortality in workhouses peaked as late as the winter of 1848 to 1849. Even in 1849 and 1850, even by that late stage of the famine, the corpses of famine victims were still frequently found on roads between towns, dying en route in a search to find relief. So why did Black 47 remain so black, and why did 48 and 49 remain so black, when Ireland's underlying economic circumstances in terms of food production and food availability at first glance appears to have improved? And why did excess mortality remain elevated for so long after Black 47? Unlike the winter of 1846-47, beyond the summer of 1847, there was no longer a shortage of food available to be bought. The problem was no longer a lack of food supplies, but a lack of income or entitlements, as economists like to call it, for the poor to buy the available food. This was therefore squarely a policy failure about distribution. In theory, the something the government could have done something about. Indeed, this was the exact problem that Peel's public work scheme was trying to trying to do by providing entitlements to help the poor buy food through offering work on public works projects. Many historians have associated the British government's failure to do this on the scale required uh, with the changeover of government between Peel on the left, he's the last British Prime Minister for whom no photo survives, is one of his um, more trivial facts about him, and Lord John Russell, um, um, uh, who um, took over with the Whig government after the Conservative Party had torn itself in half. Um, but historians tend to argue that Peel's re generous relief policies and public work schemes were dismantled by the Russell government mm -hmm. under the in influence of a multitude of laissez-faire ideologues who believed that leaving the market alone would result in the best outcome. The problem with this view, though, is it seems 46 and not 47 as the important break point. Sorry, could we move on to the next slide? Thanks. As this chart showing relief spending per year and per government, so I've split the 1846 by the changing government between Peel and Russell. Actually, the important break point is at the end of the 46, you know, at the end of 47, early 48. That in the first year in office, the Russell government spent four times as much on relief spending in Ireland as Peel did in the last year of his government. In reality, Russell initially expanded Peel's relief policies and spent much more money on them. I mean, the need in the first year of Russell's government was much greater because of the greater size of the crop failure in the autumn of 46. But this initial continuity of policy should come as no surprise looking at parliamentary arithmetic. Sorry, could you have the next slide? Excellent. No, no that one, thank you. Um, this was because the Whigs took over after the Conservative Party had split in half. 
and the Whigs, shown by the bottom bar for, um, in 1841, 1847, were the largest party, but they did not have a majority. They were propped up in power by Peel and his followers. Peel and his followers are depicted by the, um, the white box on the right um, and the um, protectionist um, rebels um, in the blue. And supporters of Daniel O'Connell's repeal association shown as the black, the, the black bar. Uh, so to get legislation through, the Whigs either had to rely on the Peelites or the repealers. Um, and therefore, it's unsurprising that they carried on many of, or initially carried on, many of Peel's policies. So you can have the next slide. So my research instead argues Whigs revised policy for Ireland in 1847 which was originally intended to provide more, not less, relief funding for Ireland, and more, and it caused more, not less, intervention in its economy, was sent off course by a series of financial crises in 1847, triggered by previous policy decisions made by Peel um, earlier in the 1840s, and also a political crisis caused by the split in the Conservative Party, which meant that there is no longer a majority government in office. The full story of how this, this policy, this revised policy went wrong can be found in my forthcoming book, which I put on on screen. Um, yeah, no, there is, other, other than pl trying to plug it, there is another reason why I put this on screen in that I believe this is the first book about the Irish famine which actually depicts the British Prime Minister as the devil on the front cover. So the front cover is a, a punch cartoon which is satirising a opera called Roberto El Diablo, um, which is about uh, really the conqueror's father called Robert, who um, was in the, in the opera becomes a devil and bewitches people using a, some magic leaves. And this is a cartoon that, um, where Robert Peel uses his banking legislation to persuade John Bull, who represents the British taxpayer, into thinking that, um, that, that he's bankrupt, while sitting, Peel is standing in front of the Bank of England's gold reserves. This is a interesting and very stylized representation of the 1847 financial crisis, which had just happened. And I'll do my best to give you a brief outline of some of the most important points about this in the remainder of this talk. I will start by outlining the intended new policy, how it was knocked off course by the financial crisis of 1847, which prevented all the loans intended to pay for it being raised. And then I'll explain how political crises caused by a government, the government not having a majority, preventing alternative ways of raising the necessary funds from, for Ireland from being pursued. I will end with some takeaway for, today's, uh, for, for today from the errors made by policymakers during the famine in the 1840s. So first, what was the Whig, new, Whig gov government's um, new policy? Um, but it developed in the very earliest days of January 1847. Sorry, could I have the next slide? Uh, so here it is. Um, it's not, this has not been discovered by historians. It's not been referred to by historians until I found it. And it's because it's in a very strange place. It is oddly in the Durham University Library. It is in the private papers of the colonial secretary, in spite of that, the colonial office did not run Ireland at this point. The Home Office, the Treasury, ran Ireland because it was in the United Kingdom. The colonial office ran islands in the Caribbean and the in Indian Ocean. It didn't even run India, which was the different off um, the Board of Control. Um, and it didn't come from the papers of Charles Wood, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and it didn't come from Charles Trevelyan, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury and later famine villain of the villain of folklore. As an aside here, I think the overemphasis on Trevelyan by some historians of the famine lets politicians in the British cabinet and in Parliament more generally off the hook for their responsibility for the policy mistakes made. Um, in that Trevelyan was a civil servant intent who was supposed to do what he was told rather than making policy himself. And this is the policy which was attempted to be implemented in early 1847. Um, and it the initial attempt to implement it does not deviate from this document. So the plan came from the third Earl Grey, the colonial secretary. 
Why was it Gray who came up with this policy? Well, initially, he was the ideas guy for the new Whig government across all departments. This was because his father, the second Earl Grey, um, who'd recently died, was um, the Whig politician most respected in the party. He had passed the reform bill expanding the electorate in the 1830s. He'd also passed the legislation through Parliament abolishing um, um, slave ownership in the British Empire. And he was, um, he had a, he was regarded as intelligent, headstrong, um, and also the um, scion of the most prestigious Whig family at the time. Um, now, um, he was an originator of ideas across the British government until he and the Chancellor of the Exchequer fell out in late 1847 over monetary policy, a point we'll come back to later in the talk. But the problem that Gray aimed to solve in this document was that Peel's policies were no longer working. They were causing rather than pre preventing excess mortality by the winter of 46. And the way they were financed was becoming increasingly politically unsustainable. So task work on Peel's public works in the harsh winter of 46, 47 was starting to kill many workers. The increasing number of widows, orphans, the elderly, and those unused to heavy later were not catered for in Peel's policy, which is assumed each family had a male breadwinner who could work on the public work scheme. Treasury officials had attempted to run the public work schemes from London, and press criticism mounted of wrathful spending, and, as well as deaths from the late payments of wages that increasingly occurred. Indeed, some newspapers actually went together and say, why are we spending money killing people? That didn't. That, that was, uh, that was the, often a criticism made in papers of both in Britain and Ireland of the relief effort. Furthermore, British MPs and the press were also growing more critical of the fact that Ireland's often absentee landlords, often absentee in Britain, were not paying anything towards the relief effort. Peel had exempted Ireland from the reintroduction of the income tax in 1842. Um, this was because he feared that uh, implementing it in Ireland would cause a massive surge in popularity for Daniel O'Connell's repeal movement. But oddly, other parts of um, these islands remained exempt from income tax until surprisingly late, including the Isle of Scillies until the 1950s as a result of this exemption. Um, but the view was spreading in Great Britain that British taxpayers were bailing out Ireland's landlords for the poverty on their estate, even though they'd made themselves rich. The island's landlords had made themselves rich from their misery when times were good. And the new policy, sorry, can we move to the next slide, sought to address all these points in turn. Firstly, the public works which were beginning to kill people were to be shut down. Um, then soup kitchens and the poor law would take over relief efforts. Um, catering for all categories rather than just able-bodied men, with widows, orphans, and the firm now prioritised for available assistance. That relief effort would be run by the poor law guardians and relief committees elected by ratepayers rather than unelected treasury bureaucrats, increasing the local accountability of relief expenditure. And the Irish landlords would begin to make some financial contribution to relief efforts. So in the original plan, for every one pound raised from the rates from them, a further one pound would be given as a grant from the Treasury, and a further one pound beyond that would be given as Treasury loan. In other words, two thirds of the costs would be advanced by the Treasury in advance, and Ireland's landlords would pay for one third of the costs up front. Um, although the original document assumed that this would mostly be written off and never paid back. Now, there was another um, bit of uh, creative counting going on here, that if you lent money to a public authority in Britain, it added to the national debt, but not the deficit announced that year, which became the underlying, um, underlying um, creative accountancy fix between Britain's, behind Britain's student loan scheme, until the Office for National Statistics in 2019 ruled that you had to include it in part of the deficit. So this is the origins of that. This is the first time this had been adopted in order to, um, and it was to, uh, adopted to increase expenditure um, uh, more than what was published. Um, so to pay for this, um, the, landlord, the landlord's contribution would, would provide political cover for the Treasury to raise two big loans in the 47-48 financial year to fund an increase in advances for Irish relief. So £5 million had been spent in the two years to the end of March 1847. 
In comparison, the government planned for two loans for Irish relief in eight, totaling £14 million pounds in the 47 to 48 financial year. This was the ambitions the Whigs originally had for their new policy. The problem was that the attempts to raise the first of these loans, worth £8 million pounds in March 1847, triggered a severe financial crisis in Britain that threatened the, later in the same year, threatened the British government's ability to finance itself. Sorry, the next, can we have the next slide? Um, and, and sorry, the next slide after that. Um, so the resulting lack of treasury borrowing in London to pay for the advances to the Irish Poor Law Unions, which was the most important part of this scheme, um, disappeared. From 18, the end of the financial year, 47, 48, it disappears to virtually nothing. And the remaining spending in 48, 49 coming from the Treasury was mainly to subsidise emigration rather than provide food, um, food, or, um, food or other sorts of relief in Ireland. Um, and so I could have the next slide. And indeed, as the, um, Lord John Russell admits in 1849, now without borrowing by the Treasury and lending for Ireland, we could have no great plan for Ireland. And as much as I wish it, I've got to see that it's impractical. So hence the financing of the, low, of, of the financing by bo the Treasury borrowing off the London money market and lending it to the Irish Poor Unions was the most important part of this scheme. So can we have the next, next slide? So what caused the financial crisis of 1847? And I argue that much of responsibility lies on a set of economic policy choices made by Peel earlier in the century and which were continued by Charles Wood as the Whig Chancellor of the Exchequer after 1846. So first, as chairman of the Currency Commission in 1821, he recommended that the United Kingdom return to a fixed exchange rate with gold. Peel's Bank Charter Act of 1844, which is the document he's raving over John Bull in, on the front cover of the book, um, later tightened this gold standard by mandating that the Bank of England could only issue banknotes above a certain arbitrary amount if it held gold in its bullion reserves to back it on a one-to-one -one ratio. Second, Peel moved Britain towards free capital and trade flows, most notably with his repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. Third, Peel sought to maintain low interest rates so that Britain could service its huge national debt from the Napoleonic Wars while maintaining a balanced budget. Peel thought that these policies would all help reduce food prices, both helping the labouring poor and preserving social stability for the benefit of the aristocracy at the same time. Now, any economists in the room would realise the problem with this, which is that Peel did not realise that it is impossible to implement all these three policies at the same time. So you have to, could you move back a slide? Um, that one, yeah, the triangle, the trilemma. Um, in that the trilemma says you can only have two out of three policies. So if you have fixed exchange rate and free capital and trade flows, you, can't, you, you don't have control of your monetary and fiscal policy. Um, and this was not realised that this was the case till the 1960s, uh, the work of Robert Mundell and Marcus Fleming. Fleming. Um, and it's something that can be seen operating in many other periods of history. The Euro, Euro area crisis of the late 2000s and the early 2010s is one more notable recent occurrence of, of, of this trilemma in practice. Hence, in theory, there's only a limit to the monetary and fiscal expansion which was possible during this period. Furthermore, the City of London had already been spooked in the 1830s by the issue of a large loan to compensate slave owners in the British Empire for emancipating their slaves, which triggered two severe financial crises in London in 1837 and 39, when much of that money flowed abroad into foreign investments. So not only was that unfair in the money went to the slave owners, not the slaves, um, it also triggered two big financial crises in London. The result of that was that simply talk of another large loan raised in peacetime was enough to settle unsettled markets. What made it worse that was the Bank Charter Act of 1844 linked the bullion in its reserves, which is affected by trade flows and capital flows in and out of the country, to the notes in circulation of the money market. This meant that whenever there was a bullion leaving the Bank of England, a trade deficit or um, investment abroad, 
the Bank of England had to contract credit in the country, either by raising interest rates, withdrawing notes from circulation, um, tightening monetary policy. And so when a trade deficit occurred or whenever any panic occurred, this suddenly caused a monetary shock in the United Kingdom. So, sorry, can we move on to the next slide? So, when Charles Wood announced the pending issue of an £8 million pound loan in Parliament at the start of March 1847 in the 47 budget, it triggered a panic. Sorry, the previous slide. Um, it triggered a panic, as can be seen clearly on this chart. It was thought that the loan would be immediately spent importing the... Um, people in the money market thought the loan would be immediately spent importing food from America, which would drain bullion out the Bank of England, forcing a contraction of credit and breaking the link with gold. This caused a simultaneous train of bullion, as represented by one of these indicators, um, with holders of banknotes fearing a coming devaluation whenever the bank ran out of gold, as well as the hoarding of notes by some investors who feel, feared that this would cause a massive liquidity crunch. And so banks started to hoard huge amounts of cash on their balance sheet. This is the worst possible combination for a bank which could not issue more banknotes to service that demand for cash without bullion in its reserve. And you might ask what caused recovery. So that's the second vertical line. The first one is the budget of 1847. You can see both indicators drop massively. What causes recovery is this occurs at the same time as the third reading of the legislation, which was to spend the loan. Um, and in that third reading of that bill, um, the government as well as backbenchers passed a series of amendments that together indicated that a large amount of money would not be spent on food in Ireland suddenly. This initially calmed markets but also gutted the original plan for relief. This crisis and a second one caused by another billion drain in the autumn of 1847 persuaded the Chancellor Charles Wood that further borrowing was too risky to pursue. The additional loans uh, but would have paid for the advances that underpinned Gray's plan were cancelled. What appears to have really scared Wood that the issue of the Irish, was that the issue of the Irish loan had crowded out interest in the Treasury's regular bill auctions to put it occurred every quarter to raise the funds required to pay the interest coupons on the national debt at the end of each quarter. So during the first crisis of 1847, so the one on this chart, the Bank of England had bought the re remaining Treasury bills for the first quarter. These are called deficiency bills. The Bank of England still does this job today. It did port about 50 billion of them in 2020 in the first COVID lockdown. But it was in addition to quantitative easing. But it was unable, the Bank of England was unable to do this in the end of the third quarter, as during the second crisis of 1847, it ran out of notes in its reserve. So it could not legally print any more banknotes because it didn't have enough gold in its vaults. So the government was forced to use the unspent half of the Irish loan, which had been raised for Irish relief, paying the, debt, the interest on the national loan, um, on the national debt um, at the end of 1847. Furthermore, I mean, there is a political angle to this. Wood did not want to be known as the Chancellor who defaulted on the national debt, particularly as um, Whig, the Whigs had lost the 1841 general election because of the mounted, mounting deficits they had presided over in the late 1830s um, and because of the 1837 financial crisis, the 1839 financial crisis. Indeed, Peel had used, accused these deficits of causing those financial crises. So George Osborne, who accused the Labour of Labour's deficits of causing the financial in 2010, was, was actually just copying something which had been a previous Conservative <laughs> slogan used multiple times before. Um, and as he is a, somebody who studied Conservative history a lot, I do not think that's a coincidence. Um, <laughs> So of the 14 million that was intended to be raised before the financial crisis began, only 4 million actually made it to be spent on Irish relief. Now, there were two main alternatives borrowing that the government explored in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 1847. So if we move on to the next slide. Sorry, this is back to the political situation. Um, but these alternatives were not possible with the parliamentary arithmetic at the time. 
So the first plan which was um, suggested was suggested by Earl Grey, who suggested that the Bank of England could be reformed to reduce the amount of capital flows, and therefore this changes the position you are on the trilemma. You choose fixed exchange rates and you get more control over your monetary and fiscal policy. It would have enabled more borrowing. Um, and so he suggested a set of reforms to the Bank of England, and these were vetoed by the Peelites because Peel saw the Bank Charter Act as his legacy. This is what, he, at the time, he wanted to be known for, um, rather than the repeal of Corn Laws, and he vetoed it. He threatened to sink the government over it. Um, so Earl Grey went off in a huff, and when Mauritius, which was controlled by the colonial office, had a famine and financial crisis, he implemented the plan in Mauritius, and people in Mauritius haven't heard of the famine of 1847 there because of the prompt. Um, it worked very promptly. It, called, it created the world's first currency board, um, which was successful in reducing interest rates in Mauritius in the late 19th century below that in Britain and Ireland, which meant that it, there was lots of capital to develop the Mauritian economy. And Ireland was relatively, relatively starved of capital because it got stuck inside the United Kingdom and using Britain's monetary policy. Um, so that wasn't possible because the Peelites vetoed it. The alternative that they pursued at the end of 47-48 was raising the income tax. The problem here was there was three problems with this, um, which all comes back to parliamentary arithmetic. So at the start, the government suggested partially removing the exemption on the Irish income, um, Ireland's exemption for the income tax and also increasing Britain's the income tax on Great Britain at the same time as a pro, pro quo. Um, this was unacceptable to Irish MPs of every party. This was because there was a property qualification to vote. The people who voted in part for MPs in Parliament were substantially the same people who paid income tax. And it was political suicide to vote for this. So there wasn't enough votes for it. When the government revised their plan to maintain the Irish income tax exemption, but simply raise Britain's, Great Britain's income tax. Um, there was a big bank bench rebellion who thought it was unfair that, unfair that Irish landlords weren't paying for anything for, 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 parts of, um, for parts of the cost. And also Peel sank it again, and that was because he thought the government should set a deficit budget again which Wood thought was a trap, that he was trying to trap him into the 1841 general election again. Yeah, there's a financial crisis and a big deficit, and the Conservatives would try to capitalise on it. Um, so moving to the next slide, returning to, this is the context in which John, Lord Ross is saying, without borrowing and lending, they tried all these other policies. We have no great plan for Ireland as much as he wished to see it. And so you're moving on to the next slide again. Um, and without a source for ad advances for Irish relief, the entire burden of relief effort was put on Irish taxpayers from 1848 onwards. This caused Irish tax rates to soar, so the rates in 62 poor law unions rose to more than 10 shillings in the pound. So this is more than 50% of income from property, and that was the fresco income from the property based on valuations before the famine, and the famine damaged the property and rental income of land. In Berliners Low, it rate, um, the rates rent up to 34 shillings, three and a quarter p in a pound, 170%. But the, although the Treasury pushed the rates to be higher and higher to raise more money, it did not raise more money. So on the left is a phrase called Laffer Curve, which was invented by somebody called Arthur Laffer in the 80s. Um, and he argued that beyond a certain point, raising tax rates beyond a certain level doesn't, doesn't raise revenue. Um, people start avoiding paying taxes, they emigrate, there's capital flight, etc. And the data from poor law unions, the amount of money they're collecting, and the amount they're, the rates they're setting works better than the US corporate tax data that uh, Laffer based his theory on. So up to 50%, it's a 45-degree it's a angle, um, so the, rate, the rates are mainly connected, c collected. 
after about 10 shillings in the pound, about 50%, the rates collected actually fall. The amount of money falls rather than increases beyond that point. And if we move to the next slide, this contributes to emigration to America. So on the left is the local taxes raised in Ireland during the famine. On the, the dotted line is um, emigration, which tended to be more middle class, more upper class to the United States on the right. And so you can clearly see that this is triggering capital flight and emigration. If people leave the country, if the wealthy leave the country, they take their cash with them. So this damaged the Irish economy. And so the answer to the question of why in 48, 49 does the situation get worse in spite of that potato yields are recovering, the answer is, is there's a fiscal crunch going on. There's austerity measures and massive increases in taxes which damage Ireland's, Irish, Ireland's economic recovery and also doesn't raise enough money to replace the advances which were intended to be issued. So, sorry, if we move on to the next slide. So, in short, this is less a story of laissez-faire. This is more a story of an attempt at intervention which went wrong due to the financial and political crisis. And there's also lessons for here today. We live in an era of scarcity and inflation, and the challenges faced by policymakers in the 1840s are actually quite similar to, as today. So, do, do countries in reaction to scarcity today of grey of food and, and energy and natural gas? Do we react by embracing globalisation as Peel attempted to, or do you shut up, the, shut, shut up, you know, close the gates? Certain countries in the world, I think India, India is one, have banned the export of certain foodstuffs in reaction to increase in prices. Other places in the world are trying to embrace cooperation and free trade. Policymakers, again, that's the issue Peel faced in 46. Do you repeal the corn laws? Do you try to work with other countries to find food supplies? Or, or do you shut up, um, you know, close the gates on the world? Um, furthermore, um, how do you mitigate the effects on the vulnerable? There is an attempt to mitigate the effects on the vulnerable. It failed, though. It was badly designed. It didn't survive financial and political realities facing policymakers at the time in the 1840s. And so I think there are lessons here for policymakers today. Um, the first one is that, um, that uh, countries need a financial system which is flexible enough to produce the fiscal capacity when necessary to, to react, to mitigate the effects of shocks on the vulnerable. Um, Britain did not have this thanks to, in the 1840s, thanks to Peel's Bank Charter Act, which is why he's the devil on the front of, front of my forthcoming book. Um, furthermore, an effective fiscal union is needed in addition to monetary union to, to, um, to, in order to, pr to, pr to um, provide assistance to uh, the vulnerable during these situations. This was not true in Britain, um, this was partly because many British people and many Irish people still thought of themselves as two different countries. It was also due to the Irish income tax exemption poisoned parliamentary arithmetic in 46 to 47 and produced basically British and Irish elites trying to throw the responsibility of paying for the famine on, on each other. Um, I suppose one thing which applies over time is that nobody likes paying income tax is one of the lessons <laughs> to draw from this. And then, sorry, on to the final slide. And also, the other lesson to take from this is that minority government does not in Britain does not result in good outcomes. I'm not referring to coalition governments, which do have a majority and can, can whip their MPs um, into, into voting for government policy. But when you've got minority government, um, you um, are vulnerable to what your backbench, every last backbencher in your party, and also what every last backbencher in the other parties you try to do deals with wants. And there is a litany of public policy failures in Britain for when you have minority governments who are minority governments with only a few seats short. So the Irish famine is the great disaster of the Brussels government. Um, Britain entered the First World War because a minority government thought it was about to collapse. So Britain joined the First World War, despite the fact the majority of the cabinet 
opposed joining the First World War because they thought the Conservatives and other parties would gang up against them in Parliament. Um, so furthermore, the situation the Whigs faced in 1847, only being a few sheets sought and trying to do deals with Irish MPs, is very similar to Theresa May's government in 2019. Um, and indeed, the DUP didn't necessarily get a very good deal for Northern Ireland from that, and neither did a lot of Irish MPs in 1847 era. So I think this is another lesson is that minority governments don't really work in the United Kingdom context. Um, but I think I should stop there and, and let everyone, uh, people ask questions. Charles, thank you. Um, I don't think it's just the uh, political situation, uh, the economic situation that uh, <laughs> finds an echo in uh, British politics today. Uh, and all of you may have picked up, but let me reiterate it, Charles has got a book coming out. <laughs> <laughs> um, questions for Charles? Uh, Charles, uh, just one question. If, uh, if the, the mic was I beg your pardon, sorry, Mark Hennessy. If uh, O'Connell's uh, MPs in 47 had voted for the tax package, could the worst of Black 47 have been avoided? Um, so I, I, I think it could have, because if there was willingness to raise taxes, they probably could have started borrowing again. Um, because in the Napoleonic Wars, it was that taxes were only increased to pay for the incremental interest rates paid for when money was borrowed. So it wasn't that they had to, let's say, pay for it out of, of the increased tax revenue. It was just the markets wanted a willingness that there wasn't going to be a debt interest spiral. Um, and when 60% of British government spending was servicing the national debt, debt interest spiral was much a bigger problem than it is for governments today when it's a much smaller percent of, of national expenditure. Um, so they could have. The, the, the issue was is that the Peel Association did have two Lords of the Treasury who actually were partly responsible for Irish policy. So there was parts of the Repeal Association were contributing to, there was some support for, for it, but the majority who didn't hold government offices didn't, didn't, didn't support raising revenue. And I, I, I don't blame them because it would have been political suicide at the next election for them to do so. Right. Thank you, Charles, very interesting. Can I make two points very briefly? You mentioned how minority governments can be bad for Irish interests. They can also be good. In 1885, there was a minority Gladstone government that the Irish were able to use that to great effect. There were 105 MPs from Ireland in Westminster. Why didn't they use that more effectively? That's my first point. The second point is this poor law union bill that goes through, it has the support of a minority government. Do they need other people? They have the Irish Liberals backing it. Do they have Irish repealers backing it? Uh, could this not be seen as a mistake? Irish Conservatives at Westminster took it different. They said, this is a responsibility of the central exchequer. Ireland cannot pay for it. We landlords cannot pay for it. Were the Conservative landlords not correct? So they could, I mean, the, the, uh, I mean, what should have happened is Peel shouldn't have tr tried not to break his party in 1846. If there was a majority Conservative government, they would have found it much easier to get legislation through, through Parliament. Now, because the result was is they needed a deal between the protectionist Conservatives and the Irish Nationalists. That was the answer. That, 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 that would have produced a majority, majority. But it was the two parties who were least... It, least going to cooperate with each other, needed to come together. Um, and the Whigs did fend that off by giving government offices to prominent um, members of the Repeal Association in an attempt. So yes, we could play fantasy, co fantasy coalition, but, um, but as you can in 1885 to 1886, so could the Irish Nationalists and the Conservatives, who did actually have more culturally in com Parnell had more culturally in common with cons conservative landowners in England than he did metropolitan metropolitan uh, liberal barristers and industrial Manchester industrialists in the Liberal Party um, but so we could play interesting what ifs but I don't think a deal between the protectionists conservatives and repeal association was 
viable in that, that period. And the repeal association was slowly disintegrating after o o Daniel O'Connell's death, which didn't help either. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's a microphone. One more question. Got Have we got a microphone? Sorry, thanks, thanks for the talk. It's amazing uh, how history rhymes. I guess the other thing that happened in 1848, what I'm wondering had any impact on this, was all throughout Europe there were attempted revolutions and all the old guard which had been installed, both Napoleon, there were, most of these revolutions failed. But I mean, in theory, just like we see many times before, there must have been capital flight and actually gold coming back to England because they didn't feel safe in... Prussia or France or Italy, all these other places, and people probably coming in. And I, I don't know whether that would have, whether that actually occurred or whether that had an impact in terms of the decision making in the UK. Because clearly, everyone else having a revolution makes you not want to have a revolution. So there's, I think there's two questions there. That's a very good question, and it was on the fourth of the government. So the first one is the fear of revolution, the political effect of the fear of revolution. That was clearly on the government's mind. I mean, this is why Peel thought repeal of Cornwall's had to happen because it couldn't, you were not going to keep the working classes happy in England if the government was going into the market to use taxes paid by working class people in England to buy food which was inflated by tariffs designed to help landowners. That was not, that, that, that political economy was no longer, no, longer go, no longer sustainable. And so Peel thought repeal of the Cornwalls was necessary in order, to, um, in order to get working class support, middle class support for subsidies for Ireland. He collapsed his government over it, um, so um, his intentions couldn't be fully implemented. But that, the fear of the repeal, um, fear of the... Um, fear, fear of the sorry the charter sorry fear of the chartists um, was an important part of that. Um, furthermore, when the revolutions in France happened in 1848, Peel explicitly said that if the protectionists he had followed what the protectionists wanted him to do, it would have been Britain as well. So he created a protectionism and revolution together. The other question was economic. So did these revolutions of the continent cause money to flow back to Britain? There was actually a bigger event going on in America which caused money to flow from Europe to America, which sucked a lot of cash out of Europe. And this was the America declared war against Mexico um, in 1847. And America raised its interest rates to 14% and insisted all taxes had to be paid in gold. This sent interest rates flying. And so um, lots of enterprising people borrowed money or moved money from Europe and invested it in American banks um, to produce money. And this contributed to the monetary crunch in 47, 48, which not only affected continental Europe, but Britain. Um, and there is some recent literature which has argued actually the 48 revolution was a consequence of potato blight, failed harvests in wheat. And the crunch, caught this monetary crunch caused by the um, war in America, war between Mexico and America. So I think you do have to think of the world as much bigger than just Europe. This is the start of globalization in the modern sense. What's going on in America and financial markets affect what's happening in America, in Europe, Britain, Ireland, and what's possible and what's not possible for governments to do. What I'm not saying is it's impossible for the British government to have unknotted this. It was just that. It was, it was just the, the decisions they made in order to try to unknot it were the wrong one, it turned out to be the wrong ones. So I'm not saying it's impossible for the British government to have done more. It's saying that, um, it's just saying that the strategy they attempted to do more didn't work. There could have been alternatives. Well, conscious of time, I'd like you all to thank uh, Charles for that fascinating <laughs>